So now that Tim has uh, um, described the uh, motivations behind this work, I, I want to address the challenge that we had in terms of handling this large number of samples, which are these um, minimum tiling uh, gene-rich bags for barley. So uh, as you probably all know, uh, if you want to use the uh, next session sequencing for uh, this type of work, um, uh, these, um, these, these uh, instruments have a limited number of, uh, uh, fixed number of lanes, for example, the Lumina HiSeq uh, has two flow cells, each of which is uh, uh, eight lanes. Usually one, it can be used for control. Um, obviously, if you allocate one bag to each individual lane, that will be very expensive and wasteful because you will obtain so many reads, for, uh, you know, a huge um, sequence in depth of coverage. Uh, so people uh, when, to, when, when they want to multiplex or put more than one sample on a lane, they typically resort to barcoding. And we contemplate the idea of using barcoding as well. In fact, we're using it, but uh, uh, the, the barcoding has limitations in the number of samples it can handle, and they cannot really uh, scale to the number of samples that we are dealing with here, which is in the, in the thousands. So the idea of using a pooling, the idea of actually uh, uh, pooling bags on the same lane, on the same uh, um, uh, sequencing lane, but without, uh, um, without exhaustive DNA barcoding, we're going to use some limited form of barcoding, as I'm going to explain later. Uh, the idea of uh, using pooling is the following, that uh, one can take uh, a bag, and instead of putting a bag in a single pool alone with a bunch of other ones, we're going to replicate this bag in a set of pools. And this set of pools is uh, carefully designed by this, this scheme so that uh, when uh, with the identity of a bag is uh, uniquely identified by the set of pools, which we call signature, which is contained. Uh, once this design is being established and, and used, uh, when we get when you retain sequencing uh, reads um, from from these pools, we expect to observe the same pattern of uh, of pools for those reads. In, uh, in other words, if a, that read um, appears in those uh, in those specific set of pools corresponding to the signature, then we can uh, we can assign the read back to the original uh, to the original backlog. So here I'm going a little bit into details of this uh, uh, pooling design because if you do want to use this, uh, you will have to make these decisions. Uh, if you do choose to use this particular pooling design, which is called shifter transversal design, this particular design uh, is one of many available. Uh, we thought uh, that it would be, a good, it would be a good one for us, and uh, in retrospect, we made a very good choice. Uh, many other uh, groups have used it uh, later. Uh, so this particular design is, uh, is, uh, is defined by four numbers, of four integers, uh, uh, the, that needs to be decided as, uh, as a function of the number of symbols n there that, uh, that uh, you need to pull. So once you know one, how many pools you have, sorry, how many samples you need to be pulled n, you need to find the prime p, uh, so p means prime number, and uh, a value of gamma, which is usually small, and I will tell you why later, so that p to the gamma plus one is bigger than or equal to n. Now, um, there are other parameters in this design. Uh, L is the number of layers. It's, uh, in fact, a t, a p, times, p, p times L gives a num total number of pools. Um, so in, essentially, you have L layers of p pools. And these numbers together also control, with gamma, control what is called the decodability. And I will explain what this property is in the next slide. So D is a function of L and gamma. Uh, yeah, so when you take L minus one, you divide by gamma here, and then you take the floor, so you round it down, D is going to be essentially your D. Um, a bag is replicated in L pool, so you have to keep this in mind. You don't want L to be too big because you have to take that back and pipette it in L places. Uh, in our case, L is, uh, is seven. So you don't want this to be 70. They will, they will take too much manual labor. Uh, and, and gamma has to be small because if you take two bag signatures, and so the the set of pools where each uh, back is assigned, and you take two of these signatures, they are going to share by design most gamma pools. So for resiliency to errors, you want gamma to be small, right? ideally one or two. So, um, so given these constraints, um, we, um, we, look at, uh, uh, we look at the problem that we had. 
and we uh, we decided that we wanted what is called a three decorable design. The reason being that, um, as you can see in this in this uh, illustration, a read R1 can either belong to one single back, uh, in this case back long B1, uh, and in this case R1 is expected to appear in L2. So that's phase number one. Now it's possible that R2 belongs to two overlapping backs uh, because remember these backs are in a minimum tiling pad. Uh, so it's possible that belong to the region of overlap between two backs, in this case B2 and B3. And in this case, by design, the, uh, the read will appear in two times L pools. Uh, so that's a second case. We also decided that we wanted to handle uh, case number three, where in the, the, the minimum tiling path is actually not perfect meaning that we have some redundancy in the minimum tiling part, and now we have three backs for which R, R, the read belongs to. Uh, be, because as I said, we didn't know, we cannot establish in advance whether our MTP is perfectly non-redundant in some sense. Uh, so we, we decided that we want also to deal with the case when we have three positive backs for a read. And this is the three, the number three that we're after. So three decorable means that we want to be able to decode a read to the original bag, so assign a read to the original bag, so that we can do assembly back by back, uh, even in the case when a read belongs to three bags. See, if a read belongs to more than three bags, then the, the pooling design will not work, will not be able to tell you the, ori the origin of the read. So, so in some sense, case number three allowed us to a little bit of wiggle room in the, the quality of uh, our MTP. So once we decided that we wanted um, uh, the number of layers to be, we decided L and gamma. Gamma is to be small, as I said. So in this case, we decided that gamma two was be, was okay. So we decided this uh, sort of forced us uh, to to take L to be seven, so that we end up with the three decorable pooling design. Remember, L minus one divided by gamma is uh, the decodability of the pooling design. So once L and, and, and gamma are set, then we need to decide uh, the, the prime number. Uh, so we look at the variety of choices here that are listed in this table. Uh, remember, we had about 15,000 bags, over 15,000 bags to be pulled. Uh, so we look at the variety of choices of pro P, so 7, 11, 13, and so on and so forth. And we look at how many uh, pools, how uh, many bags will be in each pool and what would be the total number of bags in that particular pooling design. So in this case, with P equal 13, we, have, uh, we would be able to pull 2,197 bags uh, with the number of pools being uh, seven times P, because seven is the number of layers, which is 91. This sounded like a good uh, number uh, because uh, uh, sort of it's close to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the number of uh, locations in a, typical well plate uh, using the biology labs, which is 96 well plate. Uh, and this also gave us uh, a, good, um, a good ratio, a good uh, um, uh, num a reduction in the number of samples that uh, it had to be handled. Um, so we also look at how, many, how much time this would take manually to be done, and we wanted this to be done in, in a reasonable amount of time, but it's you know, a relatively small group of people. So, uh, we estimated that P equal 13 would have been a good choice. And in fact, we ended, ended up also using P equal 11 for the very latest of these sets. And so note that the reduction in the number of samples is uh, between 17 and 24 for these two choices, which is significant. So uh, again, we started from these uh, MTP gene rich bags for barley, about 15,700, uh, and we divided them in two, into eight sets. And they're called HV3 to HV9, and then HV10 was designed with the different pooling scheme, um, sort of the leftover. Um, HV1 and HV2 were pilots, so they're not listed here. So the whole MTP bags are containing these uh, eight sets of, uh, of bags, and the first seven sets of 2,197 pulled according to the shifter traversal design with parameter 13, 7, and gamma equal 2, and HV10, which was the very last set of 1331 bags, was pulled using P equal 11. Now, once we had the set of pools, remember we, for, for the first seven set, we had 91 pools, and for the last set, we, to, we had 77 pools. Um, we, uh, we had to allocate them to the lumina flow cell 
And obviously, um, well, if you allocate one pool per lane, that will be still wasteful. Uh, so we ended up using barcoding, uh, a, a variety of schemes ranging from 13 to 16 to 20 pools, multiplex uh, via the classical DNA barcoding using custom adapters. So here is just a, an overview, hopefully we'll clarify how these back signatures are designed and how, what is the computational problem behind it to be able to recover the origin or sort of the identity of a read. So remember, we, in the pooling design, in this case, this is the case where we have seven layers, uh, uh, here represented by these seven numbers. Each layer has 13 spots. These are the sort of the wells where the backs is supposed to go. So in this case, back number one, which is, uh, uh, is supposed to go into uh, pool number one, pool number 16, pool number 20, 34, and 42, and so on and so forth. So with this number down here, these seven numbers are what is what we call the back signature because it uniquely identifies this back. Now, if we have if we if we have to encode back number two, uh, then this back will have a different signature. And as as I said, we want these signatures to be as different from each other as possible uh, because we don't want to assign the read to the wrong back. So this is back signature for back number two. And then we're going to have different signature for back number three, and so on and so forth for all the 2,197 backs for this particular uh, pooling design. Now, this is what needs to be done manually or with a robot, and uh, Tim will talk about this in a few minutes. Uh, but what happens at the other end? Suppose now that we sequence these pools, so you will obtain a file of data of reads for each of these pools, you will, have, you will get 91 files uh, from, from, from as an input. And in each uh, file, you will have reads. So in this case, suppose that we have a read that appears, quote unquote, so it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in pool number five, or file number five, and file number 17, and file number 27, and so on and so forth. How do we know which back this read should be assigned to? So the idea is simple. You simply look, if you have a back, which has a signature corresponding to these seven numbers. And in this case, just for the sake of this illustrative example, we do find one, uh, which is back number six. So in this case, this particular read will be assigned to back number six and later assembled individually within, within that back. So what happens if you have now a read? Remember case number two that we discussed before, I could have a read that overlaps two backs, right? So in that case, the number of positive backs for that read, the number of uh, uh, pools that contain that read will be uh, 14. And you will have, you'll end up with 14 numbers um, that needs to be split into two signatures whose union is that set of numbers. And in this case, again, as in this example, we have two backs, back 296 and 1179, whose back, signature, whose back signatures, when you do the union of these seven numbers, will give you the signature of the read. And then there is the most complex case, which remember we are, we're dealing with three decodable pooling designs, so we want to be able also to decode reads we belong to three backs. In this case, we, due to the pooling scheme that we devised, uh, the read segment will have 21 positive uh, pools, and, uh, uh, and we'll have to be split, we'll have to see whether we can split these 21 numbers into three sets, for which each of these sets correspond to a back. And in this case, the situation is, uh, it's clear you have, uh, you have uh, uh, the reads will have to be assigned to the, the, the green back, the blue back, and the, or the, the red back, which are listed here. As again, this is, a, this is just an example. So uh, I just wanted to show you this example because I want to uh, uh, explain what is the computational problem here. So the, the input to the decoding, or we also call this the convolution problem, is we're given a set of 91 pools of reads, right? So uh, so assuming that the pooling is actually physically done and you go through sequencing, now you obtain 91 pools of reads, um, and you're also given the signatures of the backs, right? So these seven numbers in this case uh, for each back, and you will have a list of 2,197 of these signatures. That's the input to the problem, and the output is the assignment of each read to either one back, two backs, or three backs. And of course, we want the assignment to be as accurate as possible, uh, but at the same time, we want this process not to be too long or require too much resources, uh, computational resources. So 
the, the problem is that we, here we have uh, hundreds of millions of reads to, to, to deal with. So if it, if it takes uh, a few, even a few seconds to make a decision about which, where, where each read should go, that will take a long, long time to, uh, to finish. So from, from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of computer science, we need an accurate time and memory efficient method to deal with large data sets. And uh, we developed a tool over the years, which is, we call the hash filter, which is available on that website, as well as from uh, the links are also available from the uh, from the extension webpage of this uh, of this webinar. I also want to mention that we uh, recently created a small data set of reads uh, that uh, that you can play with in some sense and using hash filter. And uh, uh, so there are some very simple script to use to run that will allow you to run hash filter and then assign the reads to the to the backs. This is a very small data set for which um, uh, it should be able to run on a regular machine. 